the title of my message will be you were raised to deliver you were raised to deliver I believe note takers are history makers so pull out notes from your phone or go through the new app threads and you can start dropping all the notes straight on threads but I want you to stay engaged with me by taking some notes I'm going to share five main thoughts concerning you being empowered to set the captives free I remember when I was first thrown into the ministry of casting out of demons at the age of 17 I wasn't prepared but see you have to understand when you have the Holy Spirit you really have all that you need and all that you need is a demon to cast them out come on somebody and many of us don't realize what we have until we're faced with the enemy amen and God wants to empower us I believe that God is raising an army not an audience God is making us into soldiers into his kingdom we're not wimps we're not wussies we're not whiners we're not complainers we are men and women of God in these last days that were called to be raised by God to shine raised by God to deliver our generation from demons from curses and from witchcraft somebody make some noise for God now in this story we see, I'm just going to give you a little background. What happens in this story was this, is that Esther is faced with a problem. Esther is a descendant from a lineage of Kish. Somebody say Kish. Now, there's somebody else who was from the family of Kish. His name was King Saul. Somebody say King Saul. So King Saul comes from the lineage of Kish. Mordecai and Esther come from the lineage of Kish. What happens is long time before King Saul, the first king of Israel, God had an enemy named Amalekites. Somebody say Amalekites. Not Malachites, Amalekites. Amalekites. Amalekites were a bad enemy and they attacked Israel when they were coming out of Egypt. And God makes this promise and He says, I will be at war with Amalekites throughout the generations. The first king that gets anointed of Israel named Saul, God sends Saul on the mission to destroy Amalekites. And Saul, instead of destroying Amalekites, he actually spared some of the best ones and he spared the king of Amalekites. Are you following me? Is everybody still with me? Those who are in the balcony, are you with me? Okay. He spares the king of Amalekites, Agagite. So what begins to happen is 500 years later, somebody say 500 years. 500 years later, the descendants of Kish, the same family of Saul, are faced with an enemy in Babylon that is a descendant of Amalekites. See, some of you face battles that didn't start with you, but they will end with you. Some of you are facing depression, suicidal tendencies, cheating and lust and it didn't start with you. It started with the generation that didn't win a battle and they passed on that demon to you. But I prophesied by the unction of the Spirit of God, what was passed on to you will end with you. Somebody shout, it ends with me. Somebody shout, it ends with me. Mordecai comes to Esther and Mordecai is facing Haman. Haman is a descendant of Amalekites. He is the descendant of Agagite. He is the descendant of that enemy that King Saul did not defeat. 500 years later, a rematch between the enemy of Israel that Saul did not defeat and Saul's descendants who are now facing what their grand, 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 granddaddy was supposed to conquer. I'm going to say that again. Whatever is not transformed in one generation gets transferred to the next. Obesity, diseases, sicknesses, emotions, certain traits. That's why when you go to the doctor, one of the first things he asks you, does it run in your family? You're like, doctor, I'm a Pentecostal. I speak in tongues. We don't believe in that nonsense. But your doctor understands something. There's stuff that just runs in your blood. You can have Jesus in your heart, but you have your grandpa in your blood. 
That's why some of the things you're battling with right now did not start with you. And you are like Esther and maybe you are in Babylon and something is coming up against you and you're like, where is this coming from? And I'm here not to teach you how to blame your parents, but how to battle the spirits that were passed on and to have victory over those curses. Somebody say yes! We can have victory over the previous, over the curses, over the traumas, over the things that have been passed on to us. The battles you are facing today may have not started with you, but by the grace of God, they will end with you. And you will pass on generational blessings instead of generational curses. You will pass on God's victories instead of God's, instead of the enemy's defeats. Amen. The idea, we look in the Bible, we see even great men of God like Abraham. But he had barrenness. He was fearful and lying. That gets passed on to his sons. They see, we see barrenness in their, in their life. We see their sons lying. We see the third generation lying. We see that things were lied to against Joseph. We see when King David dies, King David tells his son Solomon, he says, listen, when I'm going to die, you're not going to only inherit the kingdom. You're also going to inherit my enemies. And he actually names his enemies. I wish all of our parents will do the same to us before they pass away and they tell us not only the possessions they give us but the problems they had and they say hey daddy struggled with this all his life he couldn't beat it but I'm gonna pray over you that you will beat it mama struggled with this but you will overcome that divorce will not run in your family miscarriage will not run in your family high school dropout will not run in your family teenage pregnancies will not run in your family depression and suicidal tendencies will not run in your life I love this about Solomon because the Bible says Solomon he executed all of daddy's enemies and then it says this and the kingdom of Solomon was established. You can't establish your life in Christ until you get rid of your daddy's demons, your mama's demons, bad things that were passed on. Again, this is not about blaming anybody. This is about battling. The stuff that you are dealing with from the family of origin. I know you're 19, I know you're 21, but the tendencies that a lot of us carry are already in the blind line of four or five generations. And I'm here to tell you, you were anointed for such a time as this. To put an end to everything that is not from God that has been passed on to you. You can live your life in good health. You can live your life without marrying three times. You can live your life Life without dropping out of college. You can live your life without popping up pills to fall asleep. You can live your life putting an end to what the previous generation did not win. Not because you're better, but because God's power has called you and raised you up for such a time as this. To put an end to that. Somebody shout, it ends with me. Drop that in your notes. It ends with me. That's the first thing that I wanted to share with you is that when Esther was in the palace, Haman worked where Esther lived. Let me say that again. Haman, her enemy, the generational problem, worked, had access to where Esther lived. What Haman miscalculated is that his access was not as great as her authority. He worked for her husband. He thought he had access and it granted him unlimited authority. But her authority due to her relationship to the king granted her authority that he did not have and I'm going to tell you something no matter how many things you're fighting with you must understand on your worst day when you feel the worst the authority you have is greater than the access that Satan has even if your mama was a witch even if your daddy was a warlock 
even if they dedicated you to Satan, even if they did Santeria over you, your Jesus is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. The authority you have is greater than the access of the enemy. Even if you did witchcraft before you came to Christ, even if you had a blood covenant, even if you had an abortion, even if you had things that opened your life wide to demons and today you're coming in and maybe you're saying demons are tormenting me because I gave them access. I want to tell you something is that you have authority that is greater than the access of every witchcraft, every spell and every voodoo and every santeria and everything the devil has to throw against you. Somebody shout Amen. Somebody say this with me. My authority in Jesus Christ is greater than any access of the enemy. That's point number one. Is that our authority is greater than access. And I know what access is. Because every time that I would cast out a demon and sometimes that demon will scream, he's mine. When the person would commit abortion, when they would do something, when I remember praying for one, one lady who was dedicated to Satan at the age of five with the cutting of her finger and the demon says she's mine, she belongs to me, her parents are witch doctors. But see, what the demons miscalculate is no matter how much access was given to them, the authority we have because we live in the palace, in the presence of God, is greater than any access. And we revoke that authority by the power of the name of Jesus. If you were dedicated to demons, I revoke that authority. I re revoke that access over your life. If there were spells cast over your life, I revoke those spells in Jesus' mighty name. Let those spells go back to hell where they came from. Hallelujah! But I want you to notice the second thing about this being raised to deliver. Not only your authority is greater than the access. The second thing is this. You have to take the battle into the spirit realm. Write this down. Take the battle into the spirit realm. Because in the verse 16 of ch chapter 4, we see this. Esther said, go gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me, neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise and so I will go to the king. Not only Esther was married to the king and her enemy had access to the palace. And maybe today you are here and you're being demonized. This doesn't mean that the enemy possesses you. It just means the enemy has access to some part of your life. He doesn't own you. When a thief breaks into a house, he doesn't become an owner of the house. He's still a thief. When a mosquito flies through an open window, the mosquito doesn't go on the title deed. Mosquito is still a mosquito. And you can drive out a thief and a mosquito. Remember that Jesus is the owner of your life. And because He's the owner, every access can be revoked. Every sin can be repented of. And every demon can be driven out into the exile. Because the authority of the name of Jesus is greater than any spell, witchcraft, sin, or any blood covenant. Somebody shout. Amen. But the second thing that I want you to notice, and that is this, is spiritual warfare does not work with physical weapons. The second thing I want you to notice is Esther, who was a beauty queen. Esther, who had millions of followers on TikTok, Instagram, and all of the platforms. Esther, who was deeply connected in the political arena. Esther, does not tell Mordecai to create a political campaign. Esther says we're doing a three-day water fast. Why does she not fight this problem politically? Because this problem is 700 years old. Facebook ads won't fix it. Therapy won't cure it. Pills won't break it. When things are spiritual, medicine cannot help. When things are spiritual, discipline doesn't help. When things are spiritual, trying harder doesn't help. Israel did not need to work harder in Egypt when they were slaves. They needed to break the back 
of Pharaoh. When your problem is spiritual, my friend, you have to use spiritual weapons. Don't bring a knife to a gunfight. You cannot come to the spiritual war with physical weapons like positive thinking. I'm gonna think myself positive. I'm just going to breathe. I'm gonna focus on my breathing. I'm just gonna focus on being peaceful. I'm gonna remove the toxic people from my life. All of that is great if your problem is physical. But if your problem has spiritual roots, you don't clean the spider web. You look for the spider and you kill that sucker. If the problem is deeper, you look for the source. You look for the root. And the way you do that, my friend, is the old-fashioned way. It's called prayer and fasting. It's called the Bible. It's called quoting the scriptures. The Bible says that God's saints have a double-edged sword in the hand. The sword is the Word of God. When you begin to fast and pray, you're taking the spiritual warfare into the heavenly realm. See, you have to understand this about Satan. Is Satan is like a snake. Snakes do not have ability to navigate in the air. They need the ground for support. They only fight if they have a support of a ground. What eagles do is they take a snake out of its realm of comfort snatch it into the air and the snake has no balance. Snake cannot fight back. It tries to find its balance but it's being tossed to and fro by an ego. See, when you pray, you're taking that snake into the air. When you fast, you're taking that curse into the spiritual realm and the devil does not stand a chance against the praying, fasting, humbling, confessing believers because the weapons of our warfare are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. The weapons of our warfare drive out demons. The weapons of our warfare break down strongholds. I've seen tough beastly demons leave at the power of the sound of the name of Jesus from the mouth of a teenager. Why? Because when you bring them in the air, they cannot stand the chance. I want to challenge you today. Don't think the spiritual warfare works until you have spiritual weapons. If my people that are called by my name, God says, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Meaning in other words, listen beauty queen. Listen you who have maybe 500 followers and you think you're this and that. Or listen you who may be like, man, but I'm a TikTok famous. Or listen you, maybe you have more degrees than a thermometer and you feel like, man, I am a diva. I, I, I got life figured out. I have a nice car. I have a nice house. But listen, none of that is a match for the spirit. Spirits fight with spirits. Jesus says, I drive out demons, not by a Bible degree, but by the finger of God, by the Spirit of God. Sicknesses leave at the sound of the name of Jesus, not at the sound of your degree. Only anointing breaks the yoke. We break the power of the devil by the power of the Holy Ghost. Somebody give God some Touch your neighbor and say, take the battle into the spirit realm. That's why every month I do a three-day fast with a, a lot of people. And I want to challenge you to do the same. Why we fast so we last. Why we pray so we don't stray. Why something happens in the spirit realm when we fast. Something happens in the spirit realm when we pray. You can't see it but you can sense it. And that's what Esther did. Esther went into the spirit realm. What Haman did not know, in the spirit realm, she broke his back. Everything looked the same in the natural. Listen to me, young people. When you win the victory in the spirit realm, everything will look the same, but everything will be different. Number three, I want you to notice, point number three, write this down. Dress up in royalty. Don't dress down 
in rags. Write this down. Dress up in royalty. Don't dress down in rags. After the fast, I want you to notice what happened after the fast. Esther gets dressed up. She puts on her best dress. She puts on her makeup. She dresses all pretty. Remember, nothing changed. Remember, Haman is still bad. The law is still intact. Jewish people will be wiped out. But in the spirit realm, Haman just got served. Haman doesn't even know every day he's walking to his defeat. Esther comes in all party to the king and she doesn't panic. Esther doesn't throw a fit. She doesn't do this, you know, these tears rolling down her eyes. King, please save my nation. She comes in all party and she does this thing to the king. She says, King, I want to invite you to lunch. Let me just pause you for just a second. When you win the battle in the spirit realm, listen to me very carefully, young people. After that, God wants you to win the battle in the realm of your mind. That's where the strongholds are at. Demons are cast out. Strongholds are cast down. Strongholds are in here. These are harder to break. Demons are not hard to drive out. Strongholds are hard to break down. I know that from personal experience because I battled with that. I battled with the strongholds of fear. I battled with strongholds of insecurity and rejection. Every place I walked into, I was rejected. And so what happens is it's easy to come and say, Lord, I'm just going to pray and I'm just going to fast and I'm going to break that. And that is true. Things break in the realm of the Spirit. But if you don't by your choice choose to put on the garments of praise, the garments of righteousness, see the spiritual armor, God gives it to you. God never puts it on you. The Bible does not say to make spiritual armor. The Bible says to put it on. Many Christians have their armor in the closet of their theological preferences. I've gotten a ticket before for not wearing a helmet on my moped 49cc. My wife doesn't let me drive anything faster than 49. And the reason why I got a ticket is because I didn't have a helmet on. Did you know how many helmets I had in my garage? Five. I got a ticket not for not having a helmet, it's for not wearing a helmet. Every Christian has righteousness, few wear it. Every Christian has salvation, few live conscious of it. Every Christian has faith that's been given to us, few use it. See the armor of God is not something you make, it's something you put on. Because when you put it on, when you put on righteousness, when you put on peace, it's not how you feel, it's what you're wearing. Some people say, but I don't feel peaceful. You put it on. But I don't feel saved. You put it on. But I don't feel like a peace of God. You put it on. Because as you put it on, the feelings will catch up. He did a study one time with a barracuda fish. Barracuda fish is not Christian because barracuda fish eats other fish. And in the fish tank, they put a glass between a but uh, So the first they put a barracuda fish and other fish and fish just went for lunch. <laughs> Ate all. Then they put a glass between the barracuda fish and other fish. And the barracuda fish, you know, cannot see the glass. So it hit the glass, learned the lesson. Don't swim too fast. The next day, once hungry, still wanted to see other fish and to eat it, swim a little bit closer, but it didn't swim that fast. And then the third day, it swam just a little bit slower, just touched the glass, realized it's still there. The fourth day, the barracuda fish didn't go to the other side. The fifth day, the barracuda fish didn't go to the other side. And then on the tenth day, they removed the glass and the barracuda fish never went to the other side at all. Why? Because when you try something for so many times, that failure goes into your subconscious. Bible calls it stronghold. You can be delivered from demons and still live in torment because you're not free in your mind. You can break the spiritual power 
but not break the spiritual stronghold. That's why Israel were miserable in Egypt though Pharaoh was not their enemy anymore. Because Pharaoh did not just destroy their life for 400 years, he built within them a mindset of a victim. And some of you, because you live so long in bondage, you live so long in rejection, you came to Jesus, you're saved, you're new creation, but you're stinking thinking is keeping you in bondage and that's why deliverance is not just getting demons out it's breaking down strongholds it's pulling down the main thoughts that are dominant in your mind and replacing them with God's Word by dressing up put on the righteousness of God put on the victory of Jesus walk like it's true what God says about you somebody say amen let me say that again. Walk like it's true what God says about you. But I don't feel it. But there is no, there is nothing around me that proves it. Your feelings and your circumstances are not the best evidence God's Word is. I had a case one time. I wanted to bless somebody with a car. Me and my wife, we, we practice this, giving people cars. And, and one time we decided to bless a car, uh, with a car to one couple. And um, we meet with them on Sunday. Now this car that I wanted to bless them with needed to repaint the bumper because I cut a lot of bugs driving and I needed to replace the tires. So this couple in our church just lost their car. We tell them, we are giving you our car. They broke down, start crying. They said, oh my gosh, I mean, it was a very nice car. They said, oh my goodness, that is, that, that, that is unreal. But I said, just, just one thing, I can't give you the car right now. I'm going to fix the bumper, change the tires, change the oil, and then you're going to get the keys. They're like, oh yeah, pastor, take as much time as you need. If you need to fix anything else on that car, take your precious time. They leave our house, call their parents. We got a car. The parents says, where? We have it. Can you show me? No. So how do you have it? We do. They stop shopping for a car. They start telling everybody that they had a car. And when people ask them, where is your car? They say, we don't have it. They say, so are you lying? They said, no, our pastor doesn't lie. How did they get a car? Because I gave them a promise. They trusted in my word that they stopped shopping for a car and they as though they got it. They got keys two months later, but they got a car when I gave them a promise. So you must understand, the way we break down stronghold is we know the truth. We start believing God as much as we believe Fox or CNN. We start believing God as much as we believe anything else. If God says you can do all things through Him, you can do all things through Him. Put on royalty. Put on righteousness. Walk like God says it's true. Think like God says it's true. You are not ugly, worthless little thing. You were made in the image and likeness of God. Your mama maybe did not want you but God wanted you. Maybe your parents did not plan for you but you were born on purpose. God's Word says so. Somebody say Amen. God's Word says so. Dress up, not down. Your circumstances don't have to change for your thoughts to change. Your thoughts need to change first. That's the breaking down of mental strongholds. I struggled with insecurity and rejection. God didn't fix my eyes. God fixed my thoughts and my mind. And when that was fixed, everything else was changed. I still have the same physical body, but I don't have the same mind. Why? Because when you break down strongholds by God's truth, you begin to operate in a different level. Can somebody say Amen? So the first thing that I mentioned, your authority is greater than the access of the enemy. The second thing I mentioned, take your battle to a spiritual, to spiritual realm. The number three that I mentioned and that is says dress up, not dress down. Number four. Are you taking notes? Okay. Number four. Learn to eat in the presence of your enemy. Esther invites the king, but I want you where she invites him. She invites him to a feast. She knew the access to every man's heart and that is through his stomach. She invites the husband to, to eat. He comes and she feeds him. Now remember, she has a death hanging on her life. Remember, her nation is about to be wiped out. Remember, Haman, whom she invites also, is the, the worst person 
who lives on the planet earth and he's sitting there nom, nom. and I think part of her like just wants to like stab him to death like kill the sucker and she just sits there she feeds the king she feeds the king she feeds the king and the next day the, the, the first day the king says so Esther so what do you want I mean you didn't just came into the palace to invite me for lunch you want you want a purse like uh on shoes I mean uh you want to go on some kind of a concert a holiday like 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 Esther wh what do you want girl what do you want and Esther she just cooks her husband <laughs> she says yeah I want you to come again you gotta be kidding me so you brought me here so you can bring me here again she says yes I want you to come again he comes again I want to pause here for a second when you are in a spiritual warfare so many people forsake their worship in war this is why because when you are in a warfare everything goes crazy your emotions are crazy circumstances are crazy sometimes the health is going crazy grades are going crazy everything seems to go crazy and this is what many of us do we come to God's presence and we don't give him lunch we give him a list of complaints God where are you? God, why did you allow this problem to attack me? God, why are these things happening in my life? God, I'm tithing. Why am I facing a flat tire? God, I am taking, eating my greens and I'm confessing God's word. Why do I constantly have fever? God, why did that boyfriend, he broke up with me? God, why we cannot have children? God, come on God, why, why, why? What would happen? if we would replace our wise with worship. I know what you're thinking. Yeah Vlad, that's a cute sermon point. But how would you worship if Haman is sitting at the table? How do you worship? How do you press in if demons are tormenting me? If I am in the middle of warfare, I am in the dry season. This is hard. You don't understand. I can't worship. I can't lift my hands. I can't tithe anymore. I can't serve anymore. I can't participate anymore. Why? Haman is always sitting at my dinner table. Well, my Bible makes me to understand in book of Psalms that when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he anoints my head with oil. And the Bible says, He makes me sit in the presence of my enemies. That means sometimes for a season in my life, I have to eat and the devil has to watch. I will read and depression has to watch. I will pray and anxiety will have to watch. I will come to church and nightmares will have to come with me to church and watch me worship. Ah, you did not hear me. Don't starve yourself because you got a Haman. Drag that Haman to church. Drag that depression to prayer. Drag that issue to fasting. Make them watch. Karabo Sandarabahia. Make him watch. Esther eats and Haman is eating also. I don't believe you're a true Christian until you know how to worship in the midst of doubt. Until you know how to press into God when hell is breaking loose. And young people, this is where we learn it in this age. It's when Haman is there and God is not removing him for some reason and he's sitting at your dinner table and some of us we lose hunger and we say I won't eat until God kills him and God says you will die if you don't eat you need to feed yourself even if you're being attacked even if you're being tried even if you're going through a difficult time even if you are addicted to something drag yourself to prayer drag yourself to the altar drag yourself to bible reading let the enemy sit at your table as you eat 
There's some of you young people, the devil has stolen your hunger and you've been going hungry and you've been telling God, Oh God, I will only start being hungry for you and live for you when you get rid of this problem. But some of you have to learn to eat in the midst of that problem. Learn to press in, in the midst of that problem. The Bible says a man who had a legion of demons, a little bit quieter, a man who had a legion of demons when he saw Jesus, the Bible says two things happened. He ran to Jesus and worshipped. If you know anything about demons, you know these two things. They don't let you come to Jesus and they don't want you to worship. How can a man, listen to me very carefully, who had more demons than you can count, a legion, who was so crazy they had to lock him up and he lived naked among the tombs, yet a legion of demons could not keep a man from running to Jesus and getting on his knee. Don't tell me your demons are stronger than you. Don't tell me the demons and the warfare is stronger that is keeping you away from God. The devil is a liar. The part of your life Satan does not control is stronger than the parts that he does. You are more powerful than you feel. You are more stronger than the devil tells you. You can do it. You can eat in the presence of your enemies. You can fast when you don't feel like it. You can pray when you don't feel like it. You can read the Bible when you don't feel like it. You can give when you don't feel like it. Don't let the devil lie to you and say that you will only do that when everything is fine. The devil is a liar.